My talk here today is called Tales from the Closed Web, Working with WordPress Censorship in China. So just a little, about, a little bit about myself. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm a technical success manager at WP Engine. Um, I basically work with our, with our enterprise customers on their, their ability to succeed technically. So it's like kind of broader scale than support. But uh, I've been at WP Engine for almost three years. Uh, and in undergrad, I, I lived in Singapore for a little while. And then it, after that, I lived in South Korea for a year as an English teacher. And then after that, I was in China for almost three years. And then since then, I've been in Austin, Texas, working at WP Engine. So I've had, I've kind of been around and, you know, I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Asia and I've kind of developed a, I wouldn't say necessarily an affinity for it, but I have a lot of information that I feel like would be really helpful for a lot of people. So here is a, here's the view of Shanghai. This is the, what's called Xu uh, Zhao This is like the, the amazing area where they built a lot in the last couple of years. And this is actually not too far from my apartment, but when I moved to China, this is what I saw when I got there after visiting some friends uh, who were living there. And I decided I wanted to move there. And so when I did, I had a lot of different jobs that kind of took me on this weird path that ended up with me working at WP Engine. Uh, first of all, I was an English teacher for about nine months uh, at an at a elementary school. These are some first graders learning English in the middle of the summer. And as you can tell, I'm a little bit tired from teaching like about 20 first grade Chinese kids. Um, and then next, I, as I have a degree in journalism, I spent uh, some time writing and doing freelance work. This is an article that I wrote about, uh, you know, going down to Hong Kong and doing a visa run and where you should drink at, at bars in Hong Kong while you're waiting for your visa to get ready. Um, and then also, I was a secret diner for restaurants uh, who wanted to get their restaurant food quality up to Western standards. Uh, this one wasn't up to Western standards. Uh, this is a, these are called dessert nachos, which looks like they're made by Buddy the Elf. It looks like those are, those are regular like Doritos types chips right there that are, that have ice cream and marshmallows and all that fun stuff on it. And then uh, in my last year there, I was a technical editor at Microsoft at the Shanghai campus. And this is a photo from, uh, from the campus. As you can still see, there is still, even though China is working to get beyond the kind of manufacturing economy, uh, you know, with things like Microsoft, you can still see little bits of like the, the big shipping containers and, and uh, ships in the background. But in my downtime, some friends and I, we decided to start a website called Homebrew Shanghai. And so when I was living in South Korea, I was a home brewer because the only beer you can get was like a very watery lager that was made locally in the country. So my friends Danny and Jesse there were doing some beer research, as you can see. Um, we wanted to start a home brewing resource for our friends. And uh, just anyone who wants to find out where to get anything to homebrew your own beer. And so we started this website and it was somewhat successful. We had a message board uh, via BB Press set up on it and we were able to kind of cultivate a community, but because we were writing all in English, we really didn't take a, a ton of, you know, into account for the local population. Um, it was successful enough at the time that we were featured in an article in the Wall Street Journal, but, you know, that kind of takes me to the whole thing of we, didn't, we weren't building for the local Chinese or, or anyone who couldn't speak English, could not speak English. So, and that kind of helped us understand some things about the way the internet works in China. Because the internet works in ways that you probably are not too familiar with, or maybe they're totally different than you expect. So first of all, these are the main resources that are blocked in China. So when you're trying to build a website, uh, these things are going to be some problems. Uh, Wikipedia is blocked, Instagram is blocked, Google's blocked, Facebook's blocked, SoundCloud, WordPress.com, YouTube, Twitter, Dropbox, you name it. Uh, and then when I refer to Google, I mean like Gmail, Google Maps, Google Fonts, all that jazz. And so this is a fact of life if you've ever visited China or you've ever spent any period of time there that these things are just websites you can't access and it becomes a fact of life when you live there. And it's called the Great Firewall of China. Officially, the Chinese government calls it the uh, Golden Shield Project, which is this uh, network of systems that, that does a, a myriad of things that I will discuss. But, you know, so when you're building a site, you kind of have to take some of these things into account. I'm going to be discussing what you need to know in order to understand how to build a site that's blocked in China and, you know, how you can make sure that you, you're able to get uh, your readers to view the sites in China and, uh, you know, on how to design around it. So the first of all is, like, as I mentioned, like, all those big websites are blocked. And many of these, and many top Alexa websites 
in China or blocked. And um, it's done through a variety of tools. They're kind of hooked into the DNS of the DNS infrastructure of the Chinese internet. Um, a lot of it comes down to DNS poisoning and filtering. You try to go to like facebook.com and it ends up saying you get a connection reset. But this becomes extra precarious given that China has the world's largest internet population. We're talking over 800 million users. If you have a successful app, you have more users in, than Facebook does almost immediately. And to, to kind of piggyback off of that, in, the internet in China is probably the most sophisticated and pervasive form of censorship known in history, not even just on the internet. And it's one of those things that uh, you feel it in a lot of, a lot of ways that, that you want to do things during the, your daily life, essentially. Is that like, I, if I need to keep, keep in touch with my Chinese friends, it's not on Facebook, it's not on Twitter, it's on a series of other apps that I need to connect them with because they're not able to, to, to have access. But when you are a foreigner living in China, most oftentimes you use a VPN or virtual private network in order to access it. There are things like Astral, IP Vanish, that you use to get around it. It's kind of an open secret. The government knows about it. Every couple of months, one of them will get blocked and stops working. You have to cancel your account. And that's what you do to like, get on YouTube and Facebook and keep updated your, your friends and family. It's just kind of a, a paywall, essentially, to the, the greater internet at large. So then the question becomes is, but why? Like, why do they do all this? Well, like, first of all, like, there's an economic incentive for China to do this. Most of all, um, it removes a lot of foreign competition. So if you can't use Twitter, you use Sinewebo. If you can't use Facebook, you use Renren. If you can't use WhatsApp, you use WeChat. So what it does is it opens up for local, local businesses to kind of grow and China can expand its, its local market. And secondly, which is what most people think of when they, with, when they think of the purpose of the Great Firewall, is it prevents anti-communist party sites and gatherings. It prevents people from talking ill of the government. It talk, prevents people from talking about things that are not true or creating rumors that are just basically causing problems for the government at large. And thirdly is that it allows for a lot of monitoring and management and control. Because you have all these local sites like Weibo and, you know, uh, we, we chat, or also known as Weixin, that you can force these companies to abide by the, the local laws. And then fourthly is the, kind of the most nefarious thing that's kind of generated out of the Great Firewall is it's promoting the idea of internet sovereignty, is that China and Russia and a lot of other countries are kind of going this idea that the internet is not something that transcends global uh, boundaries or, or nation states, that the internet is something that should be defined by the borders of your country. And this is something that's, uh, this is going to be a big problem in the coming years as more countries begin to adopt models similar to what China is having, especially now that Facebook is working with the, the Chinese government to develop any new, some new censorship tools. Uh, I don't know if anyone has read about that in the last few days. And then lastly, uh, which is like in most extreme cases, is the fact that the, the internet is blocked uh, and allows that every internet user in China is a zombie to help promote DDoSing attacks. So if anyone's ever been DDoSed from China, there's a good chance that the Chinese government kind of allowed it to happen via the Great Firewall. But so this is like kind of the nut uh, of, of what makes up the internet in China. And so as I'm trying to develop a website for, for people to kind of gather and discuss things, it becomes a problem because you kind of get put on lists. And when I was a teacher, we had to shut down our message board for teachers because the police didn't like the unlawful gathering online of, of these teachers to discuss things. So the company I was working for said we had to turn off our message board. And so then uh, a friend of mine who works for a brewery in, in Shanghai, has, uh, again, more beer, this is the story of my life, but um, a friend of mine who runs a brewery came to me a month before this event called Shanghai Beer Week and said, hey, we want to have China's first ever beer week. We have a lot of events coming up. And we want everyone in China, in Shanghai, to be able to come and, and view the site. And so it becomes, uh, opens up a whole bunch of big questions that need to be answered. So it's a first ever beer week, and we had to host the site outside of China, because if you host inside of China, you have to register your site with the local government. And your website has to be registered to a company locally, and then you have to submit documentation to the local government about who the board of directors is for the corporation. 
So this is a whole long process that we didn't even want to deal with. So we said, let's just host it in Singapore. It's easier. And we need to reach foreigners and locals alike, and it can't require a VPN. That means we can't have Facebook assets. We can't have other assets that kind of load externally. So the first problem is, is I installed Jetpack on the site, and because WordPress.com is blocked, which connects to a lot of assets from WordPress.com, um, it ends up getting blocked. And so we can't use things like, uh, you know, WordPress.com, they can't use Jetpack comments, we can't use a lot of other issue, uh, can't use a lot of other tools that we'd want to use. And this is still a problem to this day. Um, and then eventually we kind of, did, we're able to figure out what the next steps are, what we need to know. First of all, we discovered is that you should not rely on any external APIs or functionality on your site. Don't call out to WordPress.com, don't call out to Google Fonts, don't call out to any of those things. Only have content loading directly from your server itself. Because what that does is it allows you to uh, control all the content because the internet is kind of rickety a little bit, is that if one site is moving slowly because it's been purposely throttled by the government, then it could throttle your site itself. And so in this case is you want to load everything you possibly can in one place. You want to avoid politically you know, sensitive discussion, obviously, and um, you want to know your list of blocked domains. So like I said, don't host things, don't have a like button on your page because it calls to Facebook and that site is blocked and it's going to slow down your site. And as I mentioned, Jetpack, um, WordPress.com functionality, WordPress.com is entirely blocked, so you can't even create your own personal blog there. Um, anything related to Google. And then SSL is like the trickiest one, is that due to the nature of SSL, the government can't block a website or a single page on a website if it has SSL. So China ends up just blocking the entire site. A good example was Wikipedia. When they went to full encryption last year, uh, the entire site got blocked. Previously, only articles about Tiananmen Square or the Falun Gong or other things were blocked individually, but not all of Wikipedia. So when they moved to SSL, the entirety of uh, wikipedia.org was, was blocked. So all these things, we ended up having a very successful first year. The site was, at the time, uh, Google Maps was not blocked in China. And it was, it was, a, it was a great event. Lots of we had 40 different breweries show up from around China, different bars, it ended up being a great event. I, you know, and it was something I did for two years when I was, was living in China. And in the end, I think what I learned uh, about developing a site in China is, first of all, you need to know your blocked plugins. You need to avoid uh, so foreign or social media sites or services, avoid SSL usage, and uh, you are responsible for users, meaning uh, content that can be blocked or, uh, you know, if your site ends up getting blocked. And use overseas hosting if you can't get your site registered locally. And we only got about a minute left, so I got to speed through the last couple slides here. Sorry about this. Um, so quickly, knowing the system, some extra little tidbits. 96% of all web traffic in China is from servers within China itself. That means that there's not a ton of traffic going out and then coming back in. Um, river crabs, so river crabs are the people who help block content. 50 centers are people who are paid uh, trolls by the government to say good things about the government. And then big mamas are the corporations like Sina Weibo that uh, do the things that uh, you know, enable for the system to exist. And lastly, to avoid getting blocked, just remember these, to avoid the three T's. And those are Tibet, Tiananmen, and Taiwan. Don't talk about those things. The last thing is, if you do get blocked, confirm, go to blockedinchina.net, greatfire.org, viewdns.info. And if you're, ho if you're still blocked, talk to your host. Uh, check out to see if there's another site on your server that's getting blocked, if your domain itself is blocked, and if that doesn't fail, change your host and change your server. So I can't, I have to skip to the last slide, so, because I'm over time. Uh, wait, I have about 30 seconds, so I'm gonna show it anyway. Um, so in order to help support WordPress in China, I would say continue to support non-English WordPress. That means be a polyglot, you know, uh, study Chinese, help everyone out, contribute to WordPress core in China, keep publishing, you know, the more content that's out there is always the better. And third, uh, go to wp-way.com, which means WordPress University, um, is the sole Chinese community on discussing WordPress and WordPress issues. They discuss plugin updates and, and other similar issues uh, in the community. But that's, that's all I got. Thank you.